this morning and um, I want to mention just a few things. Um, a number of you were at uh, Dr. James Bass's memorial service on Friday. Was it Friday? I forgot when we went. Friday. And uh, goodness, what a, what a wonderful man that influenced so many of us with his great Bible teaching and and uh, of course, Ann, his lovely wife, is just such a blessing too. So we want to remember Ann and uh, the rest of the family. And let's continue to remember Marjorie Brannon as she recovers. And uh, Linda held up the pig. We need to feed the pig so we can bless. Bl I've already turned in a memorial to Dr. Bass. So okay. Okay. So. So let's. Uh, as you're going out, if you drop a little bit in the pig, that will help us bless some other people. Also, let's continue to remember Wendell Pender and uh, let's see, Robbie Parks. I remember Robbie and uh, Carolyn had asked us to pray for the salvation of her neighbor, Izzy. So we want to continue to do that. And also, I want to mention Wynn and Barbara McCombs. Yes. Let's, let's continue to pray for them because he's going through a hard time. Do you have any update on that, Bill? Wynn and Barbara McCombs. Okay. No, no real update. Okay. Let's just continue to uh, to pray for Wynn McCombs. Can you all hear me back there? Can you hear me back, Jane? Okay. Well, um, I want to begin this morning by reading uh, uh, from Psalm 24. Uh, the Lord is moving in a special way in our church. I hope you're sensing it. I certainly am, and I, I want to experience all that uh, he will let me experience. Uh, this psalm says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood or, or has sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek thy face. And that's the prayer of our hearts, isn't it? that we seek the Lord's face. Let's go to him this morning and commit our time to him. Father, we thank you so much this morning for loving us, for saving us, uh, Lord, for calling us, creating us to worship you. And, uh, Lord, we acknowledge that you're moving in our midst, and we certainly want to be on board, Lord, in doing our part. We pray that uh, the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts would be holy and acceptable in your sight. And, Lord, we pray as the psalmist prayed, create in me a new heart, O God, filled with clean thoughts and right desires. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's the prayer of our hearts. Father, we, we do intercede this morning for these that we've mentioned. I want to lift up Marjorie Brennan to you and just ask that you would continue to help her as she seeks to regain use of her arms and uh, help with her swallowing and uh, just for encouragement, for her to know your presence and to sense our prayers for Barbara and Wynn McCombs, Lord, who have been such an integral part of our uh, senior adult group, praise singers. We pray for encouragement and that you would touch them in a special way. Father, we pray for Robbie Parks this morning, that you would continue to uh, help him as he goes through his treatments to bring encouragement and uh, uh, special touch, Lord, to his body. Father, we pray for Izzy. Uh, we ask for the salvation of this special friend of uh, Carolyn's. And Lord, we know there's so many others. For Ann Bass also, Lord, we thank you for the life of James Bass and how you used him in such a profound way, Lord, to <coughs> influence many of us. Bless her, Lord, as she adjusts now to uh, life without him. 
And Father, we commit this time to you as we listen to your word. Uh, would you apply it to the needs of our hearts? Uh, as we sing, Lord, as Bill Shan leads us this morning, would you bless this time? May it be, may it be acceptable in your sight, Lord, as we sing from the heart to you. And uh, just thank you for who you are. And all this we pray in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Carol. Also, Carolyn Coggin, she still has a respiratory infection and coughing. Okay, let's do she's, remember. She's better, but okay. she's still got a terrible cough. We need to remember her, and Gladine is out again with these respiratory symptoms, so uh, let's do pray about that. It's not good stuff, is it? Hi, everybody. Um, I've, since I've got to church this morning, I have changed everything that I was going to do. Uh, I used to do this quite often, and it drove everybody I've worked with crazy I mean, <laughs> when you change your mind. But uh, that wonderful solo by uh, Scott Engel, you know, uh, he has one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard in all my years. And, um, and somehow it made me think of somebody who worked with me in the in this, uh, Knox Fellowship um, uh, through the years. Uh, he was a, an opera singer, a tenor, uh, from, uh, from uh, Portland, Oregon. And uh, he decided to leave opera and come and sing with me all over the world when I was doing the, the mission work and uh, evangelism. And uh, so one time he forgot to take his um, antibiotic when he went to the dentist. Oh. He was 43 years old, had a wife and two young children. And here he was traveling with me all over. And um, he couldn't go with us on a trip to Hungary uh, because he had to go to the hospital. He's got an infection uh, because of that. And uh, they, something around the sack of the heart, I don't understand it. But anyway, while we were over there, we got a call in the middle of the night that he had died. And I, w I had to sing the next morning in an old church in northern Hungary uh, they had 1101 over the door. That's when that church was built. But I, uh, I wanted to sing Larry's song that he would have sung that Sunday. And so this morning, I decided to go ahead and sing that song. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, some of you have heard it before. And then uh, we're going to do When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, with uh, the arrangement that our choir sings. And uh, then we're going to sing two th small songs that have to do with love. Love is the theme. It's number uh, 453, 453, we'll sing two stanzas of that. And then we'll sing uh, Love Lifted Me, 462. So put your fingers on that. 453, Love Lifted Me, 462, and I'll call them out. But sing with me now, everybody. Here we go. I love the first two stanzas of Love is the theme and you surprised us, uh, would you sing that high, those little notes down there at the end? It's, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Here we go now. All the things I've been
second stanza talks about all my heart to him I give. Ever to him I'll cling. And it talks about singing, too, like the other did. Second stanza of 462. nor the future, 
nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. God chose me before the world was known. He chose me to be his very own. He Uh-huh. I fed her. Uh, 
They said she'd been drinking insure. I fed her up. I took banana pudding. She ate pudding, but no bananas. She was able to swallow? Uh-huh. Okay. And she drank well, water. That's an improvement then. And she uh, ate uh, yogurt. Good. I fed her two dishes of each of those. <laughs> well, that's a change then. And she moves yeah. her right leg and left leg. She doesn't move her right arm. She tries to talk. A few words come out. Yeah. Uh, she said, okay. I said, oh, well, you do have it. <laughs> and uh, so you never well, know. Thank you, for, thank you for that, Carolyn. That's, that's a change from when I was over there a few days ago. Uh, anyway, uh, visits are, are welcome. So if y'all would like to go see Marjorie at her house, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, they said, uh, the two girls said that sometimes their cell phones are not working real good. And if you want to call before you go, call on Marjorie's home phone. Because we'll be sure that gets through to them so they know you're coming. All right. Well, this morning we're going to uh, pick up at verse 22 of chapter 7 in the book of Hebrews. This is a chapter that uh, we've been on for a little while here. I think we're going to get to the end of it this morning. Uh, got about eight verses to look at. It begins by saying, by so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. And the author's telling us right here that the New Testament, do you have yours with you? Anyone have a New Testament with them this morning and an Old Testament? In your Bibles, that's what it's talking about, all right? Be clear about that. There's a better covenant now, and it says that Jesus has become the surety for it. Now, we don't typically use that word surety that much in our vocabulary, but you do uh, use words like guarantor. It's the same word. It means the same, the same thing. Uh, he says we've got a surety or a guarantor, uh, by the Lord Jesus himself. And this word, you know this word, I looked it up, it's a, it's a word, the surety or guarantor. It's, a, it's the word that you would use typically if you co-signed a note for somebody. Uh, if, you, if you're there and if you've got a, a teenage son or daughter that needs uh, a car, and they don't have any credit, and these banks the way they are these days, they want someone to put their name on the line to guarantee this loan. Uh, it's the same word. It's also used in the uh, ancient literature as the word for someone that puts up bail for someone that's in jail, uh, that kind of guarantor. So you understand it's implying that there was something the matter with you and with me and we needed someone to be our guarantor to get out of our sin problem. And that's Christ. Amen. Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. And I like this, this little Turner phrase he uses, by so much more. So much more. You know, he, he has done so much more than we ever could have asked for or dreamed of. I remember what I was like. I remember what it was like to be lost. Uh, I remember uh, aching hearts and aching days wishing for release from my sin, that there had to be something more to life than what I was living, right? Maybe some of you can relate to that. And when Christ came, he not only set me free, he gave me a new covenant that brought life to me. It's a life that I've been trying to plumb the depths of it now for 50 years and haven't reached the bottom yet. So it's so much more, so much more. And I think that's something that you can relate to. Now, this verse talks about we've got a better covenant, a contract, if you will. Uh, more accurately, that word in the Greek refers, is referred to as testament. In your Bible, Typically, it says Old Testament and New Testament. It's the same word that you would use for a last will and testament. Now, I know many of you have written your will. Your last will and testament. That's exactly what this Greek word is here. Uh, it would not be too loose with the biblical language to say this is the last will and testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and that's what he's bequeathed to us here. Sometimes people will translate this as covenant, sometimes as contract, sometimes as testament. Uh, it's talking about Jesus has given us a better uh, covenant, making me think that what he's talking about, the author of Hebrews, what he's talking about, what's better, why, why is this one better, better than what, is because he's, to, he's contrasting the New Testament with the Old Testament. We've spent some time recently talking about that, about trying to, to live through the Old Testament times, uh, doing sacrifices, having priests, going to the temple, keeping the law, and doing such things as that, that uh, over the centuries, people came to realize that no one was saved by keeping the law. No one's life was ever changed by that. It just doesn't do it. I can give you a list. I can give Clarence a list of 10 things to do, but it's not going to change his life. It's just a list of things to do. And so the author here is telling us something better has happened. We've had something better come along. It's a New Testament from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's so much better than the Old Testament. I don't want to go on to the next verse without reading to you something from the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Because even back there, even back in the old days, hundreds of years before Christ was born to Mary, there was revelation. Revelation. The Spirit of God spoke through Jeremiah and revealed to him something that was coming in the future. Uh, acknowledging that the law and keeping of it and doing your animal sacrifices is not going to change your life. It's not salvation for you. Listen to me, Jeremiah 31, verse 31 following. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law in their minds, and I'm going to write it on their hearts. And I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. You get revelation there from Jeremiah that something's coming and it's going to be different. It's not going to be a law outside, a list of rules. God's going to write his law his nature, his character inside people. It's going to be part of them. Well, he's talking about what you know and what I know now is the New Testament. What happened when Christ came and died on the cross for our sins. It's a new covenant, and it's so much more than we ever dreamed or ever imagined. Now, verse 23 says, There also used to be many priests, because they were prevented by death from continuing. In other words, way back there, we got priests. We got Aaron, the brother of Moses, a good man, faithful, faithful man most of the time. He had a little incident with a calf that uh, doesn't look good. But we had Aaron, and they say, uh, the historians, there were 84 high priests from Aaron to when the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., uh, 84. That's not to say that's all of the priests. There were thousands of other priests during those centuries. They were there, but something sad happened. They died. Some of them were godly men, I'm sure. Some of them we know were not. But the problem that was uh, consistent with all of them in their priesthood, they all came to a day when they died. They didn't live forever. That's what he's telling us there. They were prevented from what? Prevented from being a priest because they died. And so they couldn't continue on. Well, we know something's different now, don't we? We've got a high priest now in the Lord Jesus Christ that is life. He is the creator of life. He's the one that spoke the worlds into existence. He and I struggled last week to try to communicate this concept. The idea of eternity is something we can't grasp in our minds. We can't explain it. We just can't. 
And to say that the Lord Jesus Christ has been forever, there was never a time he was not the second person of the Godhead. There never will be a time in the future when he will not be. Uh, things change, people die, but he lives forever. Amen. There will never be a, a moment when the Lord Jesus Christ is not our high priest. We live in a strange time, a time when uh, people have largely in our culture abandoned the evangelical biblical faith. It's a time when people are looking for answers in many wrong places. Among them uh, is one idea of reincarnation. It's taught in several of the Eastern religions. It's taught in the United States of America now. Uh, I've always been drawn and attracted and convicted to the verse that says, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. That's our biblical foundation of our understanding of what happens when we die and, and, and the moment after we die. Well, I'd like to share with you, these priests, they all died. They died once, and subsequently they will face the judgment of God. They will not come back and be priests again. They will not. It's not in the revelation of God. Uh, there were people that Jesus raised from the dead. Do you remember Lazarus, I know? Do you remember the widow's son? Uh, they were raised from the dead, but we all understand they died again later. They were resuscitated and brought back to life, but they were not given a glorified body, and they did not live forever. They subsequently died and went on to be buried. Uh, we've got people like Enoch and Elijah, caught up in a, in a chariot of fire to heaven. He did not experience death in this life. Enoch was taken, uh, it says in Genesis 5, 24. The scripture says everybody will face judgment, even Christians. Lost people will, Christians will, but it's a different judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all, Christians, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he's done, whether it be good or bad. That's in our future for Christian brothers and sisters. Lost people, people that have rejected Christ in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 following, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from his face, the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the books according to their works. Judgment happens after death. The priesthood that we're looking at in verse 23, all of those priests have died. They have gone on to judgment. The priest that replaced them, the Lord Jesus Christ, never dies. He will be the judge. He will be the one that they all stand before. But because he never dies, we've got one high priest, and that's all we'll ever need, all we'll ever have. It's very different from the expectations of the Old Testament people. Verse 24, but because, but he rather, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. In other words, and I know this is going to affect people differently, generally people don't like change. <laughs> bringing, bringing change to bear on, on people now come on, give me a little, a little liberty here. Great John. It's hard. It's hard, isn't it? Uh, one of the things I see in this passage is the conviction that the Holy Spirit wants you to know that what has happened to you since you accepted Christ 
is going to continue forever. It's never going to quit. There's never going to come a time when you wake up in the morning and say, wait, this Christianity thing is not working anymore. I don't have the peace of God anymore. I don't have a hope for my future anymore. I don't know for certain that I'm saved. This is saying we've got an unchangeable priesthood. Amen. There, there's never going to be a change in that regard. There's going to be security in Christ as our high priest. He lives forever. He is eternal. And he's giving you eternal life. It's quite a thing. Verse 25. Therefore, he's also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Boy, you know, this morning in the worship service, I, there were songs and things Mike said that was just, he, they could all bring it right back over here and give it to us and what we're studying in Hebrews. Same concept, same teaching. Let me call to your attention in verse 25, the little phrase that says he's able. He's able. You know, in Spanish, uh, to say the word able is poder. Tu puedes. That means he's able. It means you have the ability. It means you can do it, right? Mm. It's a beautiful little word. And when we turn to the high priest, Jesus Christ, the author wants you to understand there's any doubt in your mind that he is able. He is able to do what he started to do. He lives forever. He is God. And he can complete what he started in your life. They say it's the grandest thing, let the tidings roll. To the guilty heart, to the sinful soul, look to God in faith, he will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. Christ is able to what? To save to the uttermost. You, you ever use that word? Yeah. Uttermost? That's a good word, isn't it? I mean, I understand what it means. I have to confess I don't normally use it in my vocabulary, but perhaps I should. Uh, it's a good word. It communicates clearly that Jesus, when he saves a soul, when he takes a man, when he takes a woman or takes a boy or takes a little girl, he's able to save them to the uttermost. Those that come to God through him. You know, there was an evangelist a century ago by the name of Billy Sunday. Perhaps you've heard of him. Very colorful man. Very colorful. Yeah. <clears throat> he was a professional baseball player uh, who was saved as an adult and has many... Uh, stories and, and he accomplished many great things for the Lord, outdoor uh, preaching services and revivals and such as that. When he preached on this verse, he called it saved to the guttermost. <laughs> that kid, and that, does that communicate? That's where I was. Yeah, that's where he was. That's where I was. That's where I was too. Yeah. I'll tell you. <coughs> Billy had a drinking problem. And it was wrecking his life, it was wrecking his baseball, it was wrecking his family. And he was saved, and I mean he was saved. And he called it saved to the guttermost to explain it. But the interesting thing is, I want to tell you something about this word. Maybe you don't know it. It's only used here and in one other place in the Bible. It's used in Luke 13, 11. The story is there was a woman who had a problem with her spine. There was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. And she was bent over and in could no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and he said, Woman, you're loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight. That made straight is the word guttermost, excuse me, uttermost, in Hebrews 7.25. It said immediately she was straightened to the uttermost and glorified God. You know, I've, I've 
read one time talking about the human spine, our back, that it's medically speaking such a marvel of creation that it's considered that it should be the eighth wonder of the world. In the work that it does to hold us up and give us flexibility and allow us to work and live and do things. It's an important thing, but when it goes bad, it's bad. It's a difficult thing. Well, this woman for 18 years had suffered with a bad back of some kind and was unable to straighten herself up anymore. And Christ came and straightened her to the uttermost. He didn't just halfway straighten her back. He made it like a little baby's back. He straightened her up and gave her back something that she had lost. It's a good illustration of this word. It means that when you're saved, <clears throat> when you're saved, that you are and will be saved completely. There's not going to come a blockage in the process of you getting sanctified where Christ says, oh my gosh, I didn't see that coming in you. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that part of your deficient character. It means that you will be saved and made into the image of Christ completely someday. Amen. To the uttermost. He saves people from everything they need saving from, is what it means. All of us are different. But the Lord Jesus Christ, as God and as our high priest, has taken upon himself the task of delivering you to the Father completely. <coughs> And that's what he's doing today. But notice it says there in verse 25, there's a condition. It says to those who come to him. Did you see that? That's, that's why we are evangelical Christians, uh, Southern Baptists. It's because we believe that right there. You see, we don't believe that everybody's going to heaven. We don't believe, like many others do, uh, we understand as we read the scriptures that a personal decision has to be made to accept the sacrifice of Christ's death on the cross in order to be saved. It's not going to happen because we happen to be baptized as an infant. It's not going to happen because we joined a church somewhere along the pilgrimage of our life nor because our parents were godly people. It's going to happen because we recognize the Savior on the cross was dying for our sin, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day. And we accept that vicarious atonement that he made for us, and we are saved to those that come to God through him. That's the way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no one comes to the Father but through me. Mike touched on verse 25 for a moment in his sermon this morning. That last phrase says he always lives <coughs> to make intercession for them. And that's something a lot of Christians need to hear. A lot of people need to hear that get a hold of it. It'll help you. What's he doing right now? He's praying for you. That helps me. You know, it says he always lives. That means he's doing it all the time. He's making intercession for you to the Father. And that ought to count for something for you on those days when you're alone and discouraged. It ought to count uh, when you can't see God working in your life. It ought to count when you come under attack from Satan and feel like you're on your own. 
He always lives to make intercession for you. I like Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemns us? It's Christ that died. And furthermore, he's also risen, who's even at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. Paul said the same thing, didn't he? Yeah. See, that's helpful. It's helpful in a practical, devotional way for your life to understand what he's doing. He always lives to make intercession for them. Isaiah 53, wonderful chapter. Isaiah 53, 12 talks about this. It says, I'll divide, this is talking about the resurrection, after the resurrection of Christ, all right? Therefore, I'll divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and he made intercession for them. See, a thousand years before Christ, the Holy Spirit spoke through Isaiah to tell us the truth that Jesus is going to rise from the dead, and when he does, he's going to make intercession for his people. He's going to pray for them. Now, intercession. <clears throat> There's some people that have got a bad idea about this. <clears throat> I've, I've run across it a number of times. That what he's doing is placating God the Father who's mad at us. The wrathful Father. The Old Testament God of fire and brimstone. And I want to tell you something. That's not what intercession is. And that's not the way the Father feels about you. He represents us to the Father so that we are acceptable to the Father. You know, God is holy. We're not. God does not look on sin. We're sinners. So what are we going to do? What can, what can we do? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ was made sin for us. Don't just say he was made sin. That's not good enough. He was made sin for us. He became sin for us. And so, in a way that perhaps we can't fathom, he stands between us and God the Father, and when the Father looks at us, he sees his son, Jesus Christ, and he loves him. We've been made righteous, white as snow, whole, clean to the Father by his intercession for us. It's not a matter that the Father doesn't love us. That's not true at all. God loves people. He loves the world. He sent his son into the world to die for the people of the world. But the other thing he's interceding for, and Mike touched on this just a moment this morning, is Satan. We do have an adversary. <clears throat> I don't care who you are and what problems you're going through in your life, you have an adversary who wants to destroy your walk. Just accept it. <coughs> that passage you quoted uh, about Simon Peter, where he was, Satan was wanting to sift him like wheat, and Christ said, I've prayed for you, Peter, that your faith won't fail when you get sifted. And when you return to me, I want you to strengthen you, brother. That's an example of intercession. That's an example of what Christ is doing for you. When it says that he always lives to intercede for you, part of it is representing you to the Father, presenting you to the Father, white as snow. But part of it is spiritual warfare because were it not for Christ's intercession against Satan, where would we be? That's hard to say. That's hard to say. Romans 8, 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It's God that justifies us. Who is he that condemns us? It's Christ who died and furthermore is risen 
He's at the right hand of God making intercession for us. Paul speaks to that. Verse 26, we've got a high priest who's fitting for us. He's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and he's become higher than the heavens. <coughs> I love the Holy Spirit, and I love his language. I believe every word of Scripture is inspired. I believe every comma and period is inspired. We've got a high priest in Jesus Christ who's fitting for us. Fitting. It means the two of us fit together. <clears throat> you and Jesus fit together. It's like a hand in a glove. It's fitting. You see it? We have a high priest who is fitting for us. Some translations say... Um, that he becomes us. That's a little more poetic. How becoming he is. I like that. It, it communicates to me what the Spirit is saying. He's higher than the heavens. He's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And he does not need daily as those high priests in verse 27 to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people because he did this once for all when he offered himself up. Now, I don't know, I have no way of knowing how many million, million animals <clears throat> were sacrificed at the temple over 1,200 years. I just don't have any way of knowing. Daily, they offered up sacrifices, those priests. But the scripture tells us in verse 27 something's changed. He did this once for all. Once for all. <clears throat> One time. And that's it. There's no more. He, he did everything that was required. Once for all. 1 Peter 3.18 Christ also suffered once for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. You know, you understand, and I do too, that he died for us. Jesus died for us. And some have tried to compare that to other things. For instance, uh, for instance a father that might... Uh, whatever the circumstances might need to lay down his life for his children. And many have. Granted, perhaps you've heard stories of a husband uh, when the family had been attacked who laid down his life for his wife. It's happened. We hear of soldiers oft who lay down their lives for their teammates. We've, we've heard more than once of a grenade being thrown into a group of soldiers and one of them falling on that grenade and taking it, giving up his life that, that uh, he might save his buddies. And those words fail me. The courage and the love of people that do that. Uh, and I do not mean to demean that at all. But I want to say to you, that nothing compares to the truth that the Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, once for all. You know, a sinner can't die for a sinner and save the sinner. It just doesn't work that way. It took a man without sin to die for the people with sin to bring us salvation. That's, that's the only way we could have been saved, and he did it. He offered up himself, it says in verse 27. So in other words, he offered himself up. Picture it. He's a priest, right? He's offering the sacrifice. He's the priest. But pay attention. He's offering up himself. He's offering himself up. He's both the priest and the victim, isn't he? He's the animal that had been slain in the Old Testament 
who's offering up himself as high priest. So we've had a marvelous thing happen. No one would have conceived that God could do it this way. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which, which came after the law appoints the son who's been perfected forever. What that's referring to the fact is this. God, in ages past, elected Jesus Christ to be your Savior. He chose the Son. He appointed Him to be your Savior. And we understand from other verses, He chose you too before the foundation of the world. Did He not? Yeah. So God has appointed the Son to save sinful man. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. God at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets but he in these last days last days he's spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed the heir of all things through whom also he made the world and he has made him perfect forever made him perfect Hebrews 2.10 it was fitting for him from whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering, the cross. He died for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He has made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. We, we can't delve the depths of this, my friends. We can't talk about this old story enough. The truth of the matter is, we've got a high priest that we can safely say to one another is going to take care of us for eternity. There's never going to be a time that you're going to need to worry about something. He's going to be there. He's, he's been appointed by God the Father. We have him on our side. And he's going to intercede for you until he gets you to heaven, until he gets you there, and he's going to take care of you from then on. Now some of you might bow up and think you don't need anybody taking care of you. I want to tell you, you do. And I believe when we get to heaven and our eyes are open that we see everything that he's done for us <coughs> to get us to this point. We're going to fall down on our knees and we're going to worship him. The lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. He's a great high priest. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for our worship service and for our Bible study time, the music we've heard. We thank you for the truth of your word that teaches us about your care, about your intercession for us. And Father, we cast ourselves upon your mercy. We understand, Lord, in small part what you have done for us, the sacrifice that you've made, a priest that offered himself up, that we might be saved and forgive all of our sins. Lord, take our bodies, our minds, and our spirits this week. Please flood us with your spirit. And use us as your instruments uh, to accomplish your will this week. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.